didn't know that the service was about to start. Now you do. Thank you, guys. Let's go ahead and stand our feet this morning. Oh, there's nothing.
grace. Beautiful song, beautiful words, and beautiful hearts this morning. We are so, so thankful that we get to um, include these, uh, these young children in our worship service. Um, and we want to say real quick, thank you so much for coming to New Hope Church, worshiping with us today. We are very blessed to have you here. We're looking forward to a wonderful Sunday of worship, um, looking into the Word, letting God change us. And, um, and following after him. Uh, I tell you what, that was a, that was a good song. Um, and just in case that you uh, were not aware, we have those, um, the kids come in and sing a song for us um, on the fourth Sunday of every month. Um, that changed a little bit uh, in November, December, when we get into Thanksgiving and Christmas, and, and the calendar changes a little bit. But, but most often, every month, the fourth Sunday is our kids' uh, kids song. So if you have any kids in your life, make sure you get them here to Children's Church on Wednesday night and to Sunday school, and they can learn the song and sing with us. Um, so we do have a couple announcements for you to be aware of uh, coming up in the life of our church. We want to make sure that you know about that. Um, the first one is that we are still selling the T-shirts uh, to support our women's ministries. Be sure to stop in the back by the T-shirt table uh, in the sanctuary today and pick up one for yourself. Um, the last day for t-shirt orders is going to be this coming Wednesday, September 27th. So don't wait too long. Make sure you stop by and get you a shirt. Uh, the second announcement is our Fall Family and Friends Gathering. It's coming up on, on Sunday, October 29th. And that's going to be right after the church service from 12 to 2 p.m. It's going to be a great time of fellowship, of fun, plenty of food, plenty of games. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, for everyone involved in our church, and it's going to be a great time for you to invite some family and friends to come join us uh, also, uh, just, for the, just for the fellowship and getting to know uh, one another. Um, be sure to watch your email for more details and more information coming up. That's going to be our fall family and friends gathering on Sunday, October 29th, and that will happen again right after the church service that Sunday. With that being said, we're going to um, take up the offering and continue our worship service. Would you bow with me? Uh, and pray. Father God, give us your joy today. Just fill us with your joy, with your unending love. God, as we heard the children sing their song, God, just let us sit in awe of your amazing grace. Help us to understand just how deep and how wide your love is. And God, help us to know, help us to remember, too, that you saved us, but you've given us a responsibility to go take that message of Jesus to other people so that they can be saved, too. And you are inviting us to be a part of your ministry, of your plan to save the world. God, fill us with your unending love and fill us with your amazing grace. As we take up this offering, God, we praise you and we thank you for everything that you've given and we are taking this time to give back to you, asking you to do mighty and amazing things with this offering, that you will enable us to share the message of Jesus with the people in our community all the way to the ends of the earth. Lord God, we thank you so much for your mercy and your forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
that you are the solid rock that we can stand on. And we thank you, Father, for the cross. And we thank you for the love that you have for us that drove you to the cross. And we thank you, Father, that what you say about us is that you love us, that we are your children, that we are blessed, that we are highly favored, Father, that we are anointed through your love. And Father, we declare today that the words you say about us are true. We love you, Father. We worship you today.
thank you that you call us loved and that in our weakness, you become our strength. We thank you, Father, that no matter how far we fall, it's never too far for you to reach us, and we thank you for that. Father, I pray today that you would help us to see ourselves the way that you see us and to realize and understand that, that forgiveness is not just for others, it's for us too, that we have to learn, yes, to forgive others, but also to forgive ourselves, to trust that you have forgiven us and that you love us, that you created us and you called us. And we stand on those words today and on your love for us. We give you praise and we give you honor today. And it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good to be in God's house. Amen. I heard of another instrument happening that God's playing outside. So uh, maybe, just maybe, he'll, uh, he'll strike that thunder at just the right time. And I just want you to know it's him, not me. Okay, so we run to the altar, come on down. So we are uh, we're wrapping up this series we've been calling The Grudge, and we own the fact that we've all uh, held grudges on some level toward uh, someone. Uh, and we have a lot to dig into today, and I want to definitely give time for, um, for us to be able to maybe have the opportunity to, to just pray through maybe whatever God might be working on us. And so I want to kind of jump right in because today is so important because I believe that, that if not all of us, most of us have dealt with this, what we're going to talk about today, is we understand the concept that God has forgiven us. We understand the concept of God's grace and His mercy, and that if we put our faith in Him, that He, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. But there's also this other side of it that we, we sometimes have a hard time forgiving ourselves. And so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything, because I'm just going to make the assumption we've all been there. On, again, on some level. When we felt like we did something we knew was wrong, and it may be in our, I mean, just way back, or maybe just recent, maybe something we're still struggling with, but we carry this, this guilt around and this shame around, and we just don't know how to forgive ourselves. We're trusting that God has forgiven us, but the other aspect of it, do I still believe, and then how do I kind of hold on to that idea that He's forgiven me, and, and I'm good with Him. So, so the question we're going to try to answer today is, what do we do when the guilt of past sins continues to haunt us even after we've been forgiven? So, see some of you shaking your head, kind of not, not shaking, but nodding. Let's, let's do it right, okay? If you're shaking your head, that's a whole other issue, okay? But, but kind of nodding at the idea that we get it, we've been there. But I want to, before we dig into what guilt and shame is, what I want to also address is, because not all guilt is created equal. So there's this idea of false guilt. This idea that it doesn't come from God, it doesn't come from the right place, it is false guilt. Let me give you a working definition of what I mean. False guilt is carrying something that wasn't your fault. So a couple of examples. Maybe some of you are like me. You, you came from a broken home. Your parents were divorced at a young age, and, and I didn't feel this way at least at, at, at that time. But maybe you felt somewhere on the way, the way that, well, maybe I was part of the problem. You know, maybe, maybe they divorced because of me. I should have done something. could have done something better. Or maybe some of you were abused in some way as a child or even as a, as a teenager, as an adult or something in some way. And, and you just wonder, you know, you carry that around even though it wasn't your fault. You didn't contribute to that abuse on, in any way, but you still feel like, well, I should have seen it, I should have stopped it, I should have said something earlier. Whatever the case would be, you carry that guilt and that baggage with you. Or maybe there's a lot of you that have had toxic relationships in some way. And you, for a while, felt like you were the problem. Now, maybe you were the problem. I don't know. Again, that's another <laughs> issue. If you don't know who the problem was, it's probably you, okay? But there was a toxic relationship, and it just seemed like you just began to have other, you know, conversations with other people connected to that person or that group of friends, and you realize there's a common denominator, and it's centered around them. It wasn't you. But you're frustrated because how did you fall for it? How did you not see who they really were earlier? And so there's this idea of this false skill. 
that we, some of us, carry around because someone else did something wrong, and we're almost holding ourselves responsible for it. And it's time for us to say, you know what, it wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. I need to let that go. But where there is false guilt, there's also a time where guilt is a gift. And that's when guilt is coming from God. Okay, so when we give our lives to Jesus, we say, God, I want you in my life. I recognize that I'm sinful. I need you as my Savior, so please forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. Renew me. All of that. At that very moment, the Holy Spirit is deposited within you. And the Holy Spirit is residing within you. And within you is going to come this, this, this guidance and this wisdom. And all these red flags and this, not just this conscience, but on a much deeper level, helping us to see that that's wrong or that's right. You're going down this path, don't go down that path. And so Paul kind of shares this difference between godly sorrow and this worldly sorrow concept. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. He says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So again, where does the good guilt, the guilt that is the gift to us, where does that come from? It's not coming from the outside, okay? people that are trying to manipulate us and the enemy that's always trying to deceive us and lie to us, but from the inside. Is God sharing that guilt? So the idea of, I didn't put this on the screen for, for you guys, but godly sorrow, we would say, is feeling conviction from something I've done wrong. So this, this feeling of sorry and sorrow is going to lead us to, okay, I'm admitting that I was the problem. I'm admitting that I'm the one who has done wrong, and I'm admitting that I need to change course, and it's going to lead me down a path, not just to seek forgiveness from God and the transformation and all that change that's going to happen, but the Holy Spirit is showing within me. Quit making excuses. It's not the world's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's not grandparents' fault. It's not the economy's fault. It's not anybody's fault. At some point, we have to say, if it's my sin, if it's the stuff that I've done wrong, at some point, the Holy Spirit is going to lead me to go, it's you. It's you. And while there are times and that false guilt is going to lead us at times to think that it's me when it's not me, but this godly sorrow and this godly guilt and this conviction is going to lead us to take ownership of my stuff. We can't know Jesus as our personal Savior until we own up to the fact that it wasn't just the world's sins that he died for. Yes, he died for your sin. He died for everyone's sin. But I need to take ownership of the fact that it was my sin too. A good example of godly sorrow would be Peter. We're going to use him on both sides of it today. But Peter gives us a lot of good examples. He had great qualities, but he also had his fair share of glaring blind spots. And on one occasion, he made this huge claim that Jesus was at the end of his ministry, at the end of his actual life. Peter didn't really realize that, but Jesus was kind of laying that foundation for what was to come. And Peter just makes a bold statement, and this is kind of what Peter does often. And they're at the Last Supper, and Peter's like, you know what? Everybody may abandon you. And then what does he say? But I, what? Never will. Like, that's not going to be me. And so Jesus kind of confronts in this time. He's like, well, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. How many times, guys? Some of you Bible scholars. All right, three times. Three times. All right. So he's like, I don't know who you're talking to. It's not me. I'll never do that. And you fast forward. Jesus is arrested. And he's being ushered through this courtyard. Okay? And Peter's out in the middle of that. And there's this little girl who comes up to him and says, weren't you with that guy? And he's like, no, 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 that's not me. And then some lady comes up. You know how it goes? There's this lady that comes up and says, weren't you with that guy? No, 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 that's not me. And then we pick up the story because it's a little bit later and it finally comes. And Peter's just, well, he's like us. He is oblivious to the fact that he's living out prophecy in the moment. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 59. 
About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him. He's obviously talking about Jesus, for he is a Galilean. Verse 60, Peter replied, watch this, man, I don't know what you're talking about. You see, well, we're stubborn, we're stubborn to the core, okay? And Paul, uh, Peter was stubborn to the core. Just as he was speaking, watch this, the rooster, what? Crowed. And then the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Has anybody ever been on a road trip with mom and dad? And you're in the back seat. And they give you the look through the mirror. Anybody? <laughs> Has anybody ever been in the back seat with your siblings or whatever? And dad turns around and he's still driving straight. He's still driving 80, but somehow he's still looking at you. Anybody? Or is that just some of my childhood playing out? Now imagine on a whole other level, Jesus giving you a look of disappointment. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord has spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now, why is that so significant? It's so significant because Peter really didn't intend to go out and say, I don't know him. And he was scared. I'm not, we're not justifying the rationalizing. I'm just saying Peter's heart was intended to do the right thing. But in the moment, the pressure of the moment, he fell. And I truly believe when he left that, that courtyard and he began to weep bitterly, I believe the, the, the main thought that came to his mind was, I can't believe I did that. And maybe that's where you've been. And that's what I'm trying to guide you to, is maybe that's where you've been before. Where you said, you know what, I'm never going to say that again, but in, in, in just, the, in just in my anger and bitterness and in that, in that moment, I said something I regret, I can't take back. Or maybe you're just struggling with something. You feel like, well, I've just, I've just got to get control of this. But it just seems like it keeps cropping up. Because every time you're pressured, every time you're stressed, it seems like that's what comes out. Or maybe you've been making promises and maybe you fell into some pressure with some friends. And it led you to make some decisions that you regret. You promised yourself you would do better, but you didn't. You promised yourself you wouldn't do that, but you did. And maybe you found yourself thinking that same thing. I can't believe I did that. And I believe that's where godly sorrow starts. It has to start with me recognizing and realizing. On my own, I'm flawed. On my own, I'm weak. So what is that? Guilt, and then there's a, is there a difference between guilt and shame? I believe there. Let me, let me show you this on the screen. Guilt says, "I did something bad," but shame says, "I am bad." And there is a huge difference in that. You see, the devil uses shame to connect your identity or your actions to your identity. So if you felt like you've done something wrong or you haven't lived up to your expectations of what you need to do, then all of a sudden it's not just about feeling bad because of something you've done or feeling bad because of something you didn't do, you didn't follow through with that promise that you made on some level. Well, then all of a sudden you begin to believe that you are pathetic, that you are worthless, that you are hopeless, and that you'll never, ever change. And I think that's exactly where the devil was trying to lead Peter. Imagine some of the things that the devil was trying to convince Peter of in that moment after that, uh, that, that, that time where he disowned Jesus, knowing Jesus three times. Imagine that the enemy is saying you blew it. Imagine the enemy is saying that Jesus trusted you, and yet you betrayed him. And then all the disciples know what you did. Your ministry. Everything that you've been working toward, it's over. So what is that guilt? When can it be good and when can it be bad? And maybe this will help you recognize maybe where it's coming from. The devil wants to use your shame to drive you away from God. But God wants to use your guilt 
to drive you to his grace. And as you're kind of processing some of the things you're being convicted of and some of the thoughts that you have, the devil's wanting you to think that because you have committed this sin and these, sin, these sins, that label is with you forever. And even if you're trying to change, you're trying to overcome that, you're never going to do it because that's who you are. It's not just what you did, it's who you are. And if I could get you to raise your hand in pure honesty, there's many of us say, yeah, that's been me before. I felt like I was my identity was wrapped up into what I did wrong and, and maybe me not living up to the standard of which I felt like God had for me. But then God is looking at it differently. Because the devil wants us to, to remain in that mindset of I'll never be that good. I'll never overcome that. I'll never be worthy. I'm always going to feel, be filled with shame. And that's always going to be my label. And you may even convince yourself, that, well, I, I'm still a Christian and I still do these things and I still try, but, but you'll never be any different. But God, on the other hand, He wants to use that guilt. If you are doing something wrong, and if you have done something wrong, He wants to lead you to say, you know what, you, just because that's something you did, or maybe even that's something you're doing, it doesn't have to be you tomorrow. It doesn't even have to be you from this moment on. There is hope in Jesus. If I'm over here, there's no hope, church. There's no hope. What's the point of saying I'm forgiven and I was baptized and I'm a member of a church and I'm involved, but I'm still struggling and I don't feel like I'm ever going to get over it? That doesn't feel like living to me. That feels like bondage. While over here, God is saying, yes, I'm going to show you what you've done wrong. I'm going to show you where you need to help and where you need to grow. But there is hope. So I'm going to look at the difference between Peter and Judas because I think they committed similar sins. Remember what Judas did? Judas betrayed him. Uh, you know, it was premeditated, it was all that. Peter was more reactionary, but it was the same thing. They both hurt and disappointed our Savior. But I want you to look at, at this. Judas, it was worldly sorrow, which looks like he was caught, he was embarrassed, and he was ashamed, and then that led him to take his life. So all of a sudden you have Judas, he does something wrong, and then his immediate reaction is, okay, it's not that I did something wrong, just it's, I got caught in it. And then he begins to feel embarrassed, and he begins to feel overwhelmed, and then he begins to go, there's no way out. So where was he on this side? The devil had him right where he wanted him, right? He had him convinced that he would never be forgiven, that Jesus would never welcome him back in, that Jesus would never show him grace. He just truly believed that that's what I did. It was wrong, but I'm never, ever going to come back from it. So he goes and he takes his life. There's no hope. And on the other side, you have Peter. You have a man who was wrong. He was sorry. And then it led to repentance. So let's get to maybe where you are. Maybe you're not just struggling with the heavy sins from your past. Maybe you feel like you just can't seem to stay on track over the same old things because you feel so defeated so often. And here's what it might look like for you. You want to be more generous, but you just don't follow through. You want to be more kind with your words, but you just don't follow through. You want to find a better balance between work and home, but you just don't follow through. You want to get involved in ministry somehow, but it just seems like you can't balance your time. You want to overcome this particular sin, but it seems like you've been battling it so long, you're never, ever going to defeat it. 
So what we're going to call this, we're going to call this the worldly sorrow cycle. Because what this looks like is, I feel like I'm genuinely in a relationship with Jesus. I know him and he knows me. But it seems like I'm doing good, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, and all of a sudden, I slip. I feel bad. I seek God for help, and I, maybe I go to church, maybe I call a friend, or whatever the case may be, and I feel good, and I feel good, and I feel good, and all of a sudden, what happens? You're sorry, you're genuinely sorry, you're genuinely sorry, but then, then all of a sudden that happens again. And it's not just a, an act of something, it, it could be a reaction of something. You say that you're going to be kinder, you say that you're going to be more gentle with your words and with your actions, you say that you're going to be more present, you say that you're going to be more committed, you say that you're going to be more faithful, you say that you're going to follow through on all of these things that you know you should do. And I know our family, we should be more engaged and we should be more involved in, in all of these things and you say all these things and it's good and it's good and it's good and then it's not. And you're genuinely, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but all of a sudden you're, you're good, you're good, you're good, and then what happens? So if that's us, if we want to own it, we want to say, yeah, I've been through that. Is there hope? Well, see, Peter, it's another occasion where he's to the end of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus has died, he's resurrected, and he told his disciples to go back to Galilee, wait for him. So they went back, and they're doing what they know to do, and they're fishing. Jesus shows up. Peter comes down and has this conversation with him. And I've used this illustration a lot because it's one of my favorites. But he gets down and he's asking these three questions. And he's just asking him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the first two, he's just he's saying, do you love me more than anything and anyone? And Peter's like, I love you as a friend. We're, we're good, right? And at the last time, Peter finally gets that question and he, he gets what Jesus is saying. Peter, don't you just love me as a friend? Like, we're just, we're just bros. Here. And Peter recognizes it. And he said, Yeah, you're right. To this point, I've only loved you just as friends. I really haven't been all in. So, how do we move from just seeing God as this friend, as this someone that no matter what we do, he's just going to be okay with it. And it doesn't really matter because I remember I got saved. I remember I was baptized. I remember, I remember I've been good more than I've been bad. You see, if that's, if that's how we're measuring us being good with God, I think that's flawed, to be honest with you. So how do we start? We start with 1 John 1 9. He says, If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, no matter what that sin is lies, deceit, cheating, neglect, words, lust, doesn't matter what it is, He said, Confess it. I'm faithful and just and I will forgive you. So, you can't change your past. But God can change your future. Amen. You're not going to do anything to change who you were or what you've done. But praise God, there is hope that God can change you from here on out. Amen. So when you begin to understand and begin to think about Peter and all of his flaws and all of his fails, all of a sudden he comes out of this and he's the first preacher. And he preaches his first sermon and it's on repentance. And 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus Christ and the Big C Church is launched. And I believe it was in that moment, in that moment on that, on that shore of Tiberias, with that conversation with Jesus, where Peter finally accepted what we need to accept. And I want you to follow me here and just how powerful what we're trying to get to here, okay? That that is what I did. It has to start there. That, that, that is what I did. It, it was a failure. It was a sin. I neglected. Whatever it is, I've got to take ownership that that is what I did. Not because of so-and-so. Not because of this or that, this circumstance. You don't know. 
That's what I did. But it's not who I am. I am a child of God. Amen. In church, if, if, you're, if you're having a hard time and you're having a hard time processing and, and just saying with that within your heart with meaning, then that is a gift today. That the Holy Spirit is trying to convict you in a loving way to draw you closer to himself. So if we're having a hard time just with that first statement of, that's what I did, then that's where it needs to start. That I, I, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I did. Help me to take ownership that it was me. And if you're having a hard time accepting that next one, well, that's not who I am any longer. If you're struggling, say, well, I, yeah, that's what I did, and I feel like I'm forgiven, but, man, that label still haunts me. It still kind of comes with me sometimes. Well, then it, it's time to just start owning into and, and settling into. That's not who you are anymore. And start replacing that lie with the truth, is that you are a child of God. Someone pointed out to me, you imagine the guilt that Paul brought into his relationship with Jesus. And we can list all the things that Paul did before he came to know Jesus, but I want you to tell you, don't think about the last thing that he did. I can't even fathom that God in his mercy and grace would reach down and say, you're the guy that's going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But that's what Jesus did. Paul, if you don't know much about where he came from, Paul is, he's sitting on a little hill and there's a man named Stephen who was a good, godly man who wouldn't stop serving the poor and serving the helpless in the name of Jesus in this little community. And so Paul comes along and he says, I'm going to teach you guys a lesson. So he brings Stephen out and he strips and takes his clothes and he puts him in the middle of this little area. And Paul holds his clothes. And everyone is commanded to pick up stones. And on go, he said, throw. And Stephen is laying there, being stoned to death to the point where he looks up to the heavens. And what does he say? He offers forgiveness. With his last breath, his last moments. And Paul is watching him. In fact, he's leaving that town and he's going to Damascus. And he's going to do more things to more people. And he has an encounter with Jesus that changes his life, changes history. Can you imagine the struggles and the guilt? Well, he wrote this in Philippians 1.6. He says, being confident of this. What is this? That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion of the day of Christ Jesus. What does that mean in the context of what we're talking about here today? It means that if Jesus has saved you because you put your faith in him and he's offered you this free gift of grace, just as we talked about in 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, be faithful, just forgive you, purify you, all that. Then it's time for you and me to accept what he's given you. And understand that what he started, he is going to complete. What he started, he is always looking for what's good for us. So what are we dealing with? What are we struggling with today that we need to overcome? Tonight, uh, this morning, all right? So there's, I think there's three things that we've been talking about. Let me, let me wrap it up with this. False guilt. Things that you haven't done wrong, but someone else has done wrong to you, and you're carrying that false guilt. It's time for you to realize that that's not your burden. That's not your burden. It, it's the enemy throwing this stuff at you. It's not your fault. You need to just say, you know, that's not me. Don't believe the lie. The second thing is maybe past sins that still haunt you. If it's those past sins, you need to trust that God has forgiven you. 
declare war against that lie. That's not what you or who you are. It's what you did. You don't have to carry that label anymore. You're trusting that you are forgiven. You are good. God doesn't hold that against you any longer. Amen. And then there's this last part. There's this last part. Maybe there's some that are still struggling to overcome this one sin. This one thing. It feels like you just can't overcome it. I think this morning is just time for us to just declare war on that sin. Instead of feeling like we're playing defense and wonder when we're going to fail again, what if we began just to declare war on that? And I think it starts with how we see God. I think that's where it starts. If I truly see that my sin offends God, doesn't that change my perspective? See, Isaiah 6, he has this vision and he sees God, he's high and lifted up and he's on his throne. And Isaiah was a good man, he was a spokesman for God, he was a prophet for God. But when he saw God for who he was, all of a sudden in comparison to him, he looked at himself and he says, Filthy. I'm unworthy. This morning, what if too often, too often we just live our lives just making assumptions that God loves me. our sin, he is broken. And church, what I don't want, see the enemy isn't hiding in the dark anymore, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> the enemy is, is not hiding in plain sight, he is just in plain sight. And the church should be drastically different. And what I don't want is us to find the line tow it and say, okay, I'm good. I want to be sure that in my day that I'm living, that I'm honoring him, that I'm not just living my life and walking through my life and saying, well, it's not that big of a deal. Who is this bothering? It's just what I'm going to struggle with. When's the last time that that's been an excuse for us that we've just gone to God in our personal prayer time and said, God, this, I know how they feel about it, but how do you feel about it? I don't know where you are today, but I trust that you know Jesus is your personal Savior. That's where it starts. But I also encourage you to take some time today to just ask God to show you if there's something within you that needs to be confessed. And there's something that you're still struggling with that you know you shouldn't be doing. It's time to declare war on that. Instead of saying to God, you know who I am. this relationship because of your grace and because of your mercy.
mercy. And help us not to drift and help us not to neglect the voice and the promptings of the Holy Spirit that wants to speak and wants to draw us closer to you. Help us to learn to recognize the voices of the enemy and the voices of the world that wants us to feel guilty for things that we, we're not supposed to be guilty for. That that's not against us. And help us not to buy into what the enemy wants to hold against us that you've already forgiven us from. But maybe there's some here today that are still struggling with a particular sin. And it's time to declare war on that sin today. Show us, God, where we failed you, where we've fallen short. And help us to leave here today accepting the fact that that's not me anymore. That's not me anymore. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave lives within each and every one of us today. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.